start with a double murder, and one that leaves a chilling impression because it may not be an isolated crime. Perhaps the killer has shown lethal violence before, and the intense fear is he may do so again. Connie Sheridan and her daughter Jan were stabbed to death ten weeks ago at their home in a remote part of the Fens on the Cambridgeshire North border. They lived on the outskirts of the village of Upwell, breeding whippets. And though they were on good terms with another dog breeder who lived not far away, Connie and her daughter lived a fairly isolated life. There's a load of food coming for the dogs at half past one. I do hope you can be back by then. My legs are not so good today, you know. And I don't want to be here on my own when they come. Not when I'm feeling so shaky. I'll be back before then. Well, I hope so. You really shouldn't feed the cats, you know. It, it just irritates the dogs. Those dogs can see too much. That's why they bark so much, you know. Oh, she's just in a mood today. You shouldn't take me no Jan and Connie moved in nine years ago, and I didn't really get to know them very well. And then, about three years ago, two teenagers broke in and let all the dogs out. And that's when we became more friendly, as we decided that we should keep an eye on each other's property if we were out. Connie was a sweetie. I like Connie very much. We got on very well together. Oh, hello, Connie. It's Molly. Do you want to send Jan over? I've got newspapers for your kennels. When Jan was at college and Mum was there on her own, I used to ring up to see if she was all right and we'd have a nice long chat, you know, putting the world to rights. Oh, hello, oh. Jan. The road to the Sheridan's home is a single track with hardly any traffic. I was wary of any cars I didn't recognise because it's a dead end road and I'd suffered a number of thefts of farm machinery in the past. So when I didn't see the car return again, I decided to go and have a look for myself. It was a pale coloured car parked next to Connie and Jan's house. G567 PVM. But that registration number doesn't exist. Did he get it wrong, or was the number plate false? The Fenland drains are noted like for their uh, coast fishing. There's bream here, there's roach, there's pike, there's zander. I'd seen her out walking the dogs on a regular basis, and on this on the Thursday, we were actually packing up to go home. Good morning. Morning. There were other fishermen at Pingle Bridge in early January. Were you there? And did you see the Whippet Lady or anything unusual? We know Jan went into Outwell that Thursday afternoon. Then, presumably, she went home. Next morning, on the Friday, neither Jan nor Connie had put out their rubbish for collection. It was the first time that had ever happened. Jan used to collect my dog world on a Friday. Sometimes it would be a Saturday, and of course that weekend it didn't come. My friends came to pick me up on the Saturday, about midday. When we drove past, I noticed that the curtains were still partially across. Saturday evening, I was still a bit concerned. I looked over the gate and I could see the lights were on in the kitchen and I thought, oh, that's all right, you know. But on Sunday, Jan failed to turn up for work at nearby kennels. The owner was alarmed, especially when she heard Jan's whippets in distress. Jan was very reliable, conscientious, but most importantly, she really loved the dogs. Dogs were her life, her passion. I thought something was wrong because in the five years she's worked for us, she's there on the dot. She's never been sick, never not turned up. She's 
turn up for work and there's no reply at the house but the dogs are all barking. Something must have happened to them. It's so unlikely to not turn up and not phone. Ready for lunch, Molly? Oh, I'm going to find my husband. I'll call the police. You better wait for the police. The smell and the baying of the dogs made it clear that something terrible had happened. I still feel they're there. It's just like a bad dream, you know. I can't imagine that they're not there. I'm still going to do things like ring them up and say I'm going out or coming back from shopping. I don't see Jan's car and I think, oh, Jan's gone out and these silly things. And then I say to myself, oh, I must let Connie know that. I think, oh, stop being so stupid. I mean, you think you'll probably wake up and they'll be there. Paul Chapman, in this truly awful crime, you've been investigating for 10 weeks, you've never divulged the motive. What do you think it is? We're unclear on the motive. Um, it isn't clear by any means, but we're, at this 10 weeks in the inquiry, we think the motive is actually sexual. And given how isolated their house is, down this dead-end lane, is it somebody who's local? It's undoubtedly somebody who currently lives locally, or somebody who perhaps in the past has lived in that locality, has got some very, very good local knowledge. If you know the area, you just wouldn't stumble across Janice and Constance's cottage. It is very, very isolated. Do you suspect they might also have known either Jan, or, well, either of them, either Connie or Jan? Yes, if it isn't somebody living locally or has lived locally, it's somebody who's particularly targeted these two ladies. Now, if you've got somebody who is perhaps sexually rather odd, I mean, with all that implies, someone who would murder, I mean, that's not anything you'd imagine of a relative or, or a friend. Put all this together, grey car, silver grey car, is that connected? Yes, we're fairly sure it is. This is a vehicle which was seen by a witness in a farm access immediately next door. You're not, sure what, you're not sure what sort of car it is, are you? We're not. I mean, the witness describes the vehicle as being possibly grey or silver in colour, certainly light coloured, saloon or hatchback, and around about a medium size. If you're the brother, sister, flatmate, if you've been a former cellmate, if he's been in prison, if you're an uncle of, of the offender, is there anything you'd notice about him? I'd like people to think very, very carefully about somebody close to them in the days leading up to and after the murders of Constance and Janice. This is in the, at the end of the first week of January? That's right. Did you notice some change in their behaviour? Perhaps they were traumatised. Perhaps they were actually suffering from some type of stress. And of course we mustn't forget that after the murders, the offender may well have been bloodstained. They may have washed clothing, which is totally out of character. Or of course they could have discarded clothing. And the offender might have been in the house for quite some time, so he might have been away from his home or from even his place of work for many, many hours. That's a possibility. In fact, hours running into perhaps a day. Now, look, let's go back to this car, because obviously it's terribly important, at least to eliminate. Yes, the, it is. The, the witness, this is the number that he, he remembered, and it's probably that he transposed a couple of... I mean, he was remembered for quite a long time, transposed yes. a number or two. Yeah. But somebody's got a car with a number plate like that. Yes, it's a likely that that index number has either been remembered slightly incorrect, in, incorrectly, but of course we can't rule out the possibility that it's at a false number. And that actually adds weight to the fact that this is a premeditated crime. Now, a lot of people knew the Whippet lady, and you, I know you want to contact anybody who knew Jan or who knew, knew Connie. A terrible, terrible crime, this. That's right. We're looking to local people to provide us with information people who were visiting the area, and they would include fishermen fishing for pike and sander in the, in the near waterways, and also people within the whippet community. Their whole lives revolved around their love of breeding and showing whippets. Nationally, they travelled the country doing this. OK, well, even if you don't think you've got a crucial clue, Paul Chapman and his colleagues really need all the help they can get in this one. Please ring if there's anything that rings a bell. There's a reward, up to £25,000, but of course there's much more at stake than that. Crime which is live, the number is free, 0500 600 600, and there are more detectives, not only here, but standing by in Norfolk, and they're on 01553 665 000.
That's Kings Lynn, double six five triple zero. Salesman jailed for double murder. On Monday the 3rd of April 2000, Kevin Cottrell was found guilty and jailed for the murders of Janice Sheridan and Connie Sheridan at their home in Norfolk in January 1999. He was a former door-to-door -door salesman. And he was arrested in April of 1999, so three months after the murders and one month after the Crime Watch appeal, so it was a very effective appeal. The police who offered a £25,000 reward do not know why Cottrell committed the murders and said he was clearly very, very evil and very wicked. He was a salesman with the Swindon-based kitchenware firm Cleanies and is believed to have spent the night in the house. More details about the murders can be found here. They found Connie lying on a sofa with eight stab wounds to her chest, one to her stomach and one to her forearm and Janice had been stabbed once in the back, twice in the neck, and six times in the chest. She had not been indecently assaulted, but her breasts were exposed and her trousers removed. Her ankles had been bound together with black tape, and forensic tests revealed that her wrists had been bound in a similar way before the tape was removed. She had been stabbed in the back when clothed, but stabbed in the chest when her breasts were exposed. Cottrell's fingerprints and a shoe print matching one of his boots were found in the house. His DNA was in the wounds on Janice's chest and police later found a blood-stained Cleanies bag at Cottrell's home containing both Janice and Connie's DNA. Cottrell admitted meeting Janice and Connie in 1998 when he was working for a home improvements firm, but he told the police he had sold them a window but never been to the house again. He did have previous convictions for two house burglaries in 1983, and there was evidence to suggest that he had an obsession with a teenage girl who lived at one of the houses. So it seems like the circumstances of his previous convictions fit in with the murder of, of Connie and Janice Sheridan. The murders were featured on TV back in 2007, and Kevin was given two life sentences after admitting the murders. But still to this day, he has never told police why he killed the women. But I'm delighted to say that this murder was solved. Some crimes, like the murder of Rachel Nickell or the abduction of James Bulger, capture the public's imagination and touch the nation's heart. Our next case is one that's had relatively little national publicity and yet deserves a great deal more. It happened six weeks ago on the outskirts of Wakefield in West Yorkshire. Our Crime Watch reconstruction only hints at the physical violence. We hope to prompt the recollection of potential witnesses who might not have understood the implications of what they saw that night and, frankly, to prompt the consciences of those who know who the killers are. Hello, what's this? I thought you were going down to the job centre today. I am. This is the latest fashion. I thought I might go dressed like this to get me noticed. <laughs> Come on, look. Let's see if there are any jobs in there. Here. So. There you are. There's that one. Well, that's no good. You need word processing. Yeah, well, I might as well write for it. I mean, I've written enough. That last letter I did was really good. I'm surprised I didn't get an interview for that. Yeah, all right, if you want to. Julia was keen to work. That she one? wrote an awful lot of letters. Oh, right, Not all jobs replied to her, unfortunately. Uh, and that used to upset her a little bit that she'd put the effort in. Uh, but it never disarmed her. Mm, she bounced back. I always thought that the best job for Julia would be in fashion. Because she had a very canny knack of picking up bargains. No, but you could wear that body that She really loved clothes. Though. Julia always wanted to look smart. Hey, sis! You'll be pleased to know I'm not borrowing your top tonight. Yeah, but I bet you're raiding my mum's wardrobe. I don't know why you always have a dig at me. I always wash and iron your stuff and put it back. If you really want to know, my mate Sarah lent me some money for a new outfit. What do you think? It's nice, that. Hi, Mum. Hi, love. Are you up out again? Yeah, I am. Where are you going tonight? Going around town. Yeah, I met up with Sarah at lunchtime. Thought we'd go out for a drink. Sis! Can I marry your mascara? Julia loved life, yes. She, uh, she packed a lot of, lot of fun into those 18 years. And, mm. She had a tremendous zest for life, did Julia. Hiya, Julia. Hiya. Hiya. Yeah, in a bit. I can't get me hair to go in. Nice oh, I said you would, didn't I? Oh, yeah, I've got a spot. I've I tried have. to cover it up. Oh, nobody's going to see that thing. You think? Yeah. 
Oh, it'll have to do. Hang on, I'll just say bye to your mum. Right, Mum, I'm off. What do I look like? All right. You look lovely. Are you going to be late? Should be in about two-ish. OK. All right, see you later. Have you got your keys? Yes, I've got me keys. ta Bye, Mum. Julia and her friend Sarah had spent the night in several clubs and pubs in the Westgate area of Wakefield. As they were leaving at 2am, they met an ex-boyfriend of Sarah's, and Julia was none too pleased. Julia resigned herself to going home alone. Look, if you want to go off with him, that's fine. Go on. But can you lend me some money for a taxi? Only I haven't got any. Here, lend you fiver. Oh, thanks ever so much. Are you sure you're going to be all right? Yeah, I'll be all right. Well, look, we'll walk it to taxi rang. Look, I'm a big girl now. I'll be all right. I'll see you tomorrow. ta -ra. Julia didn't get a taxi. For some reason, perhaps to save the money, she decided to walk home. We always told Julia that uh, if she missed the bus or uh, she ran out of money for a taxi, she must string home. This was impressed on her from a very early age. And Julia's always done that many times. It's just completely out of character for her to walk home. Julia's five mile journey home to Crofton would have been a long and lonely walk at three in the morning. Several people recall seeing her, noticing she was barefooted and wearing thin clothes for such a cold night. This lorry driver and his wife remember Julia, and someone else out late that night. We saw a man walking on his own. Further along the road, we saw a young girl. She didn't look to be panicking. She wasn't looking over her shoulder. She was just looked as if she was walking home. A few minutes later, a local resident in Doncaster Road remembers seeing a young woman talking to someone outside the Stoneleigh Hotel. It's now around 3.30. Hello. Hi, it's Julia. Julia, what are you doing at really this time in the morning? I don't even think Sarah's in yet. I don't think she's in. All right, bye. No one knows why Julia called Sarah or where she found a phone. Was it this box in Montague Street just down from the Stoneley Hotel? Or was it from somebody's house? And who was it who woke a resident in nearby Gordon Street? Two hours later, around 5.45 a.m., Julia was somehow back on the Doncaster Road, where a motorist saw her in the company of three people. They looked like they'd been out all night. I got a good look at the first girl. She was about five foot six, light coloured hair, short cropped at sides, could have been dyed. It didn't look a natural colour. As the couple walked past, unsteady, I saw another girl. As she came round the car, she actually looked as if she was going to ask me for assistance. See ya. At that point, I looked to my left again, and I noticed another chap. He walked very slowly, looking at me all the time. This bloke looked to be about five foot ten, very well built, muscular, dark complexion. As the driver pulled away, the group appeared to be having a heated discussion. But not long afterwards, when another motorist saw Julia, what he witnessed was a great deal more disturbing. Julia was found dead two days later on waste ground at the end of Montague Street. If you were the girl who saw her being beaten, her family are desperate for you to put right what you can. She may be 
frightened to come forward or maybe frightened of the, the boyfriend or but I wish she would come forward and, and give the police all the pressure she can. I would say that whichever of the people come forward, the police will see them at any time, at any place, anywhere, and until we apprehend the person or persons concerned, we can't lay our daughter to rest. And if, of course you will see anybody anywhere, anytime, and in confidence, but I mean this was an astonishing attack. It's certainly the worst one that I've ever had to deal with. It's a young girl, a lovely young girl, who made the mistake of walking home that morning. Um, and after the attack, she was badly beaten and suffered a, a long sexual attack. Now, there are going to be many people in their hearts who want to help on this one. Um, I mean, obviously, the other girl there, the, the other young woman in that foursome, assuming this, it was Julia, and there's every reason to suppose it was in the six o'clock sighting, she actually tried to save her, it seems. That would, it, from the witnesses, she was very upset and she was uh, upset at seeing the, the men hit her. Uh, I can't assure her of her safety until she comes forward. I'm worried for her safety. I want her to come forward, uh, but I can only make sure she is safe once she has come forward. Now, you've got a very good description of her. Yes, we have. She's described by one of the witnesses who saw quite clearly as being about 17 to 22. She's uh, a well-built girl and she had this distinctive hairstyle which was cut short at the back and at the sides. And look how distinctive these e-fits are. This is how one witness described her. Now look at the next one. And of course, they hadn't seen each other's uh, drawings, each other's descriptions. They're very, very striking there. And a good description of the young man as well who tried to stare out the car driver. Yes, he's uh, described as a little older. He's uh, 21 to 26, quite tall, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, muscular build uh, with short, fair hair. And he's described as looking hard, a hard-looking man, but someone who's, who would be attractive to women. And probably a lot of people will have seen this group in the Agbrig area because, I mean, they were somewhere around there from, what, 3.30 in the morning until 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning? Well, it could have been as late as 8 a.m. because uh, certainly we, we know Julia was there walking home at 3.30. We don't know what's happened to her since. If um, she's met someone who she knew or she's come across someone, she's been in that area, and that's the important thing. She's been in the Agbrig area from about half past 3 until about 6.30. This is the early morning of Friday the 29th of October. Of course, rather than walking around the streets, she could have been in somebody's house. Yes, it's more likely that she was in someone's house. and It's, it's important that uh, anyone that's got information about a party next door, or, uh, movement next door, or anyone that fits the descriptions, they've got to come forward. Now, she could have been in a white van too. Tell us why this is so crucial. There's a sighting of a white van, nearly well, getting on for four o'clock. Yes, like we that. do have the, the screams, as was shown in the film. If, if someone was running up that street, they would eventually go into Montague Street, which is the street where Julia's body was found. A van was seen driving up that street uh, just before 4 a.m. It's distinctive in as much as some commercial bodybuilder would know that vehicle if he saw it. It's about a Ford Transit in size, but the, the distinctive thing about it, it's white, but the, the roller shutter doors and the stanchions at the side, they're unpainted. Um, Aluminium shutter, very, very distinctive. There won't be many like that. It's a diesel truck, we think, a diesel van. There's a £5,000 reward, incidentally, as though that was necessary. Here's the number, 0500 600 600. Please call us. It's a free call number here to the studio. Or you can ring the Wakefield room on a free phone number there, 0800 318 001. That's free phone, 0800 318 001. The murder of Julia Baines was one of the most chilling and scary reconstructions ever seen on Crime Watch. And the person that murdered her was caught. And his name is Shahid Mahmood. Shahid Mahmood was 20 at the time of the murder. He was sentenced on the 24th of May 1995 to 14 years and 7 months, due to end on the 24th of December 2009. As the judge said, this was a singularly brutal sex murder. The victim, who was 18, was perhaps foolishly walking home at about 3am through the outskirts of Wakefield. The defendant saw her pass, somehow lured her to some waste ground, and there attacked her, raped her, and buggered her, and beat her up so that she had no less than 72 separate injuries, three broken ribs, and a dislocated jaw. She was strangled with her skirt, which had been forcibly removed from her body, and he already had a previous conviction for indecent assault. Now, how Shahid was identified as the murderer came from a DNA match from the scene of the crime. But I can't find any articles that show the exact method that he was caught by. 
but all I can say is that in the overall judgment, he was sentenced to 16 years and 17 months, less the period spent in custody on remand for the offence, so therefore overall 14 years and 7 months. Now what happened after that? Well Shahid Mahmood Welia was jailed again over a Wakefield child sexual assault. A man who spent 25 years in prison for murder has been jailed for 6 years after being found guilty of sexually assaulting a child. Shahid Walia began assaulting the girl in a house in Wakefield in 1989 when she was about 6 years old. The abuse stopped before 1992. And of course in 1993 he was convicted of murdering Julia Baines near her home. He was sentenced to life and released in 2018. So shortly after Walayat's prison release, the abuse victim reported the earlier sexual assaults to West Yorkshire Police and he was found guilty of four counts of indecent assault and one of indecency with a child at Leeds Crown Court on Wednesday. And this was back in 2001. So he is not due to be released until 2007. But I'm happy to say that this murder was solved. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want me to do more of these videos, let me know in the comments. Till next time, people. Don't have nightmares and do sleep well.